Hey there, welcome to Fungal Friends, a presentation in the Passport to Nature series by the Land Conservancy of BC. I'm Larissa Braun, Environmental Technician and Covenant Coordinator, and behind me is the Bleeding Tooth Fungus, supported by the Lion's Mane, Eyelash Cup, and Turkey Tail, a fine group of fungal friends. Today, we're going to go over TLC and the Passport to Nature program, a brief introduction of fungi, a long soaking into the roles of fungi in forests, and then some thoughts on how to use fungi in restoration, as well as ways you can participate in mushroom season with associated resources. The Land Conservancy of BC, usually known as TLC, is a team of seven women who are celebrating 24 years of conservation this year. We are always thankful to our donors and members for allowing us to do this important work. We have three programs, conservation covenants, education and outreach, and land acquisition. Right now, we are a part of the Passport to Nature program, which is designed to connect you with nature. Through COVID, we've had to adapt this to be online which has a huge benefit of making most of our videos online after they've premiered. You can visit our website to find more. My goal today is to stoke your enthusiasm for fungi, especially because it's the upcoming mushroom season in BC. Check me out over here, ignoring all the beautiful views from the top of Grouse Mountain. Little does everyone else know, I was looking into my hand lens at this jelly fungi and potential slime molds. Instead of learning about the heavier side of mycology today, I'm going to show you some of my favorite fungi and their roles within our forests, as well as ways that these fungi can be used in restoration and remediation. Almost everything we go over today will include a BC mushroom that you can observe. I find it helpful to remember the mushrooms around me by learning about them. There are many resources shared at the end of this presentation to help you dive deeper into fungi. Throughout everything, I relied heavily on my friends in Tangled Light, Mycelium Running, and Mushrooms of British Columbia. Whenever these aren't cited, you can find the source at the end of the slides. So, our primer on fungi is pretty short and sweet. I like that. Fungi are organisms in the kingdom fungi. There's a couple other kingdoms near us, which are plants and animals in the eukaryota domain. Types of fungi include the yeast, like this yeast above that's used in brewing. There's also molds and mushrooms, which are both very visible. Now, mushrooms are a type of fungi that are pretty interesting because they're a fruiting body. It's a fleshy, reproductive structure visible to the unaided eye. It's similar to the fruit of a plant, except that the seeds are spores. Imagine that a mushroom is like an apple, and the mycelium is like a tree. The apple seeds are mushroom spores. Both above and below ground, everything a fungus is, is made up of tiny microfilaments called hyphae. Collections of hyphae can build mycelium, rhizomorphs, caps, stems. Today I picked five different ways that fungi are a part of our forests. Although these are organized into neat looking categories, fungi usually don't fit into discrete boxes like this, and much of these boundaries are blurred and remixed throughout the presentation. I thought I'd take this moment to show you a few of my favorite fungi to find and photograph, including one of the bird's nest fungi, the fluted black elfin saddle, the orange peel fungus, which I've been tricked by many times, the fairy puke lichen, and the earth star. Decomposer fungi are called saprotrophs. I like learning about the etymology of words, and saprotroph is a true winner, with the Greek translation meaning rotten, putrid nourishment. Fungi decompose by excreting enzymes and acids that break down complex molecules into simpler ones. These byproducts from decomposition can be used to make more fungi parts. Or, 
This also is why fungi are known as the recycling system of the forest, bringing up nutrients locked up in structures that make up things like plants or animals. Oyster mushrooms and turkey tails are both white rot fungi, which break down the lignin in wood. Lignin is an important structural molecule that provides rigidity and support to cell walls. Pretty tough stuff. After these mushrooms work their magic, the result is white and spongy material left behind. Bonus! Oyster mushrooms are one of the few documented carnivorous mushrooms. The mycelia can digest and kill nematodes, little tiny roundworms. Parasitic fungi live in or on another species, gaining nutrients at the host's expense. Here are three different types of parasitic fungi that we can find in BC. Starting with the tree parasite, the honey mushroom, which is more widely recognized for farming, forming giant networks like the humongous fungus in the Malheur National Forest in Oregon. This 880 hectare organism is considered one of the largest and likely one of the oldest in the world. Although through a forestry lens, the common name is the armorillia root disease, as it can negatively impact a forest. Next to that, we have the truffle eater, which is an interesting case of a mushroom parasitizing another mushroom. Typically, truffles are invisible because the fruiting bodies remain underground. People even have to train dogs or pigs to help them locate them. Although, when this deer truffle is parasitized, by the truffle eater, it serves an above ground flag marking the location of the secret truffle below. In BC, we even have relatives of the famous zombie fungus that can control the brains of carpenter ants. Our example here is the Cordyceps militaris that isn't so selective regarding its prey choice. It'll munch on many different insects. Some parasitic fungi are pathogenic meaning they can cause disease. For example, check out the beautiful orange glowing arbutus tree in the bottom of this slide. To the left of it is a dying tree characterized by long strips of black in its bark. These are susceptible to a variety of fungal leaf blights. These cause cell death and even complete cell die-off, known as necrosis. On Vancouver Island, We've been enduring successive seasons of drought and climate change, which have weakened our arbutus trees. Now they're more susceptible to a variety of fungal leaf blights, which are killing our local trees. Also interesting is this wood frog, a potential host of the chytrid fungus, which has been observed in BC. This microscopic fungus causes chytridiomycosis, which is severely impacting amphibian biodiversity worldwide and contributing to the extinction and decline of hundreds of species. Mycorrhizal fungi. In this association, the hyphae of a fungi either surrounds or penetrates a plant root. Then this hyphae can bridge the space between the roots of separate plants and also improve the root function to do things like better access nutrients or moisture at least 90% of plant species rely on mycorrhizal fungi. These are considered obligate relationships, meaning that both the plant and the fungal partners depend on each other for survival. Mycorrhizal hyphae are 50 times finer than the finest plant roots and can extend the length of plant roots at least 100 times. Two of our very famous BC mycorrhizal fungi are the King Boleti and the Pacific Golden Chantrel. The King Boleti is one of the most commercially important edible mushrooms in the world. You might know it by its Italian name, Porcini, which means little pig in regards to its fat stem. This mushroom cannot be commercially grown, and instead it relies on the interconnected nature of its natural environment to thrive. Even chanterelles, such a treat for the eyes. It's likely how they got the second name of the binomial, Formosus, which means beautiful. There are lots of different mycorrhizal relationships. Here's a selection of some of my favorite. One is the two-week creation 
of a way to exchange nutrients between plants and fungi. A plant photosynthesizes and creates sugars for the fungi, which aren't able to do that, whereas the fungi have little tiny microfilaments, the hyphae, which allow the plant to get hard to access nutrients and moisture. Another example is the way that mycelium can provide connections between physically separate plants underground connecting the root systems, and this allows the transfer of nutrients and information. For example, a warning sign that there's a pest around. This is a huge component of Suzanne Smart's work, which is covered in the popular book, The Mother Tree. Merlin Sheldrake likes to say that plants are social networked by fungi, which is what it means when we call the underground interlinked mycelial networks the wood wide web. Another great example is mycoheterotrophs. These are plants that don't photosynthesize, like the ghost pipe that's pictured. What these plants do is they connect up with a mycorrhizal fungi and they take those nutrients from plants doing hard work. Here, the ghost pipe, which you can see in spring along the sides of trails, later in fall nearby will be replaced by the short-stemmed rusula its mycorrhizal partner helping it do plant crime. Bonus, if you wait even a little bit longer, if you're lucky, a beautiful parasite named the lobster crust will take over your short-stemmed rusula, making a tasty lobster mushroom in its wake. Lichens are collaborative organisms composed of a fungi, a photosynthetic, cyanobacteria, and or an algae. There's also studies ongoing that are looking into how the suite of bacteria that are in lichen support these amazing formations. The functions of each of the component organisms include structure provided by fungi, as well as prov provision of nutrients by the photosynthetic partners. Together, all of these partners come together to form a composite organism. This is an emergent property because the lichen as a whole has different properties than each of the components on their own. Lichens are also an awesome example of mutualism, meaning that each species involved benefits from the relationship. Fun fact, up to 8% of Earth's surface is colonized by lichens. Here are four that are fun to see around BC. The beard lichen, the lungwort, the lipstick lichen, and the pincushion. To get that level of detail in pincushion, a hand lens would be helpful. Lichens have many roles within the forest. Even the presence of lichen is the indicator of higher air quality since they are so sensitive to pollution. On our left, we have lichens as a wildlife food source. Rodents, ungulates, and insects are some of the species which include lichen as a food source. Above this, we see a hair lichen. These are extremely important to the declining mountain caribou population in BC, which relies on an ancient forest to be present because these are able to establish hair lichen communities for winter sustenance. Beside that, we have another role, which is nitrogen fixing. The cyanobacteria in lichens can fix nitrogen from the air meaning that unusable forms of nitrogen can be turned into forms that lichen and other organisms can use to create proteins and organic acids. As well, lichens are able to weather rocks. Crustose lichens, like the one pictured above, begin by physically breaking up a rock. This is then followed by the secretion of chemicals, which dissolve and digest the rock. This allows nutrients found in rock to be freed and recycled into the environment. There are a multitude of ways that fungi can be incorporated within repairing and supporting ecosystems through practices including ecological restoration and remediation. Opportunities to integrate fungal applications into supporting ecosystem repair and recovery are based on the roles of fungi we've been discussing today. It is important to mention that the precautionary principle should apply to any restoration actions taken. 
reintroducing species to an ecosystem can have many unintended consequences. I feel like these thoughts here provide great fodder for future experimentation and discussion. One example is supplementing mycorrhizae. In my own experiences, supporting the redevelopment of native plant communities is challenging. This is due to a combination of factors, including damage to the environment and the connected components, which is further stressed by the effects of climate change, such as drought and extreme temperatures. By supplementing or encouraging mycorrhizal networks, there is potential to improve restoration outcomes by more holistically approaching repair. Remember, the mycorrhizal associations allow plants to redevelop their connections to each other, like a whole ecosystem. Same with allowing the plants that you're adding to the area to do a better job at uptaking nutrients and moisture. Another thought for consideration is the role of parasitic species. Parasitism can positively impact an ecosystem by accelerating forest thinning and limiting monotypic stands. When this happens, the resulting dying plant products can provide habitat and forage for insects, mosses, bats, and more. An interesting example I found is the introduced species of Phragmidium in BC. This is a rust that affects the highly invasive and densely encroaching cutleaf and Himalayan blackberry. These plants are ubiquitous and are highly competitive with our local ecosystems. As well, they're very challenging to remove. Ouch. Who knows? Maybe the rust will do some of our work for us in time. One last thought is how fungi work in decomposition. Actions like retaining wildlife trees or inoculating the spores of decomposer fungi can accelerate decomposition processes. For example, a wildlife tree is already weakened and it is able to invite opportunistic fungi to decompose and improve nutrient availability in an area. As well, the same way that fungi break down plant matter can be applied to the similar chemical compounds in oil. Different forms of mycobooms, like the one pictured above, have been trialed in marine, freshwater, and terrestrial ecosystems, with some evidence for effective dismantling of toxic compounds like crude oil. So, fungi are not only accessible and amazing, and have an incredible amount of benefits to the mind and the body and the soul, but mushroom people are fun, as you can see beside it. You can participate in mushroom season by going outside. There are mushrooms literally everywhere, including your backyard, and these are all waiting to be admired. You can join a local mycological society and connect with others in online forums and groups. I'm a big advocate for reading, and your library is chopped full of books about fungi. Read a book, or you can even listen to a podcast to help deepen your connection. Also, it's great to participate and learn from others. There are forays and mushroom shows abound, and they're coming back in the swing as fall sets chorus. Now, I know if I were you, I'd be thinking, there's a lot of ways I can participate in mushroom season. I wish there was a resource list. And you know what? I got you covered. Grab your phone, focus it on the QR code, and then observe the beautiful list of resources that I created for you. I included some of my favorite interest books, a couple of great guidebooks, podcasts, including a single episode by Future Ecologies, and a long podcast series that interviews people that have different relationships with fungi, local societies throughout BC, online groups throughout BC, and a couple of trusty websites. Thank you so much for taking time with me today to talk about fungi. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on our YouTube channel. Bonus content, photo sources, double bonus content, sources that weren't cited in the three books that I mentioned.